Okay, in this video we're going to talk about the Wittig reaction. This is a reaction that we react an organic phosphorus compound. This is called a phosphonium illid. Um, there's actually two ways to represent this structure. Here we have a, we're showing it as a carbon double bond to a phosphorus. That phosphorus also has three phenyl groups or three benzene rings attached to it. And a little later we'll show you another way to represent this compound. But we take this phosphonium illid and that can react with an aldehyde or a ketone. So here we have, um, I'm showing this reaction with a ketone. When these two compounds react together, we get out an alkene and triphenylphosphine oxide. So essentially the carbon that's connected to the phosphorus now forms a double bond to the carbon that was attached to the carbonyl generating our alkene. And this is the main organic compound that we're interested in forming. So let's look at our first example here. In, in this reaction, steps one and two, we're actually going to make our phosphonium illid. So steps one and two will make our phosphonium illid. It'll have a structure similar to this. And then in step three, we add in our electrophile. In this case, we have a ketone. So um, we'll go through the mechanism and then predict what the actual product is that we make. Okay, so going through the mechanism, first thing we want to remember is that phosphorus is right below nitrogen on the periodic table, so it has a lone pair. And in step one, we're simply going to do an SN2 type reaction. The lone pair on the phosphorus will attack the carbon, will break the carbon bromine bond, and that will generate our first structure. So we now have a new bond from carbon to phosphorus, that's the P, and that phosphorus is connected to three phenyl groups. So PHE stands for phenyl. There's three benzene rings attached to this phosphorus. So this is a P for phosphorus, PH is phenyl, and there's three benzene rings attached to that phosphorus group. The consequence of this is now phosphorus has four bonds, therefore our phosphorus has a positive charge. So now we look at our reagent in step two. So in step two, we're adding methyl lithium, and methyl lithium is really acting as a very strong base. So some other bases you could use, sometimes people might use butyl lithium, and that's fine too. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty common base you could use. Um, either or, so let's see what happens when we take this compound and react it with a strong base. What I'm going to do here is add in our hydrogens to that carbon. And let's draw in our methyl lithium. So if you remember with methyl lithium, this is a very, very polar bond here. So we have an extremely polar bond. So our carbon has a partial negative, and our lithium has a partial plus. We can almost think of this as CH3 minus. And this is going to act as a base. And what's going to happen is we are going to deprotonate one of these hydrogens, and that is going to put a lone pair on the carbon. So the structure that we get out here, we still have our phosphorus and our three benzene rings. That phosphorus still has a plus. Now we only have one H here and a lone pair and that carbon now has a negative sign. So what we've actually made here is this compound is actu actually our phosphonium illid, the same thing we see up here. And this is essentially just another resonance structure. So let's just kind of show that, how we can represent this compound either way. So we can simply just draw a double bond between the carbon and the phosphorus 
and that phosphorus again of course still has our three phenyl groups attached to it. So what we see here is sometimes our phosphonium inlet is represented as a carbon double bond to a phosphorus as shown here but we also can separate that pi bond to have a positive charge on our phosphorus and a negative charge, a lone pair, on our carbon. And you'll see when we're drawing mechanisms uh, sometimes it's easier for students to use this form but you can really use um, either of these resonance structures to represent the phosphonium illet. So both of these are the exact same compound. Either of them are acceptable to use when you're talking about the mechanism or showing your intermediate. So this is the product we get after step two. Triphenylphosphine substitutes the bromine. Methyl lithium is a very strong base. Deprotonates the hydrogen to really generate our phosphonium ilid. Now in step three we have our carbonyl. Here we have a ketone. So let's continue with the mechanism. So what will happen is we're well aware that carbon of carbonyls, carbon of ketones, have a partial positive charge. So let's draw that partial positive charge in. The oxygen has a partial negative, making this carbon of the carbonyl electrophilic. And here we can see that we have a very good nucleophile, and that's exactly what happens. Our nucleophile will attack the carbon of the carbonyl, breaking that pi bond. If you wanted to draw the arrows from the other structure, you just go from the double bond and attack in the same place. Okay, so let's draw our next intermediate here. So I'm going to draw our ketone in red. And we now have a single bond to our O. That O has um, now three lone pairs on it and a negative charge. We've also just formed our new bond from the carbon of the carbonyl to the carbon that's connected to our phosphorus. So this carbon is now still connected to a methyl, an H, and a phosphorus and now to that carbon there. So let's draw that in. This is connected to a carbon, an H, and our phosphorus. That phosphorus is still connected to three phenyls. So we have pH 3, and that phosphorus does in fact have a positive charge. So what you'll notice here is within the same molecule, we have a negative charge on our O, a positive charge on our phosphorus. An interesting oxygen and phosphorus make very strong bonds. So the next step of the mechanism is this O minus will actually attack the phosphorus. So let's draw the structure we get out here. There's our cyclohexane ring. We still have our bond to O, still connected to our carbon, to another carbon and an H. This is now connected to our phosphorus and a new bond from our O to our P. I'm kind of running out of room here, but we also have our three pHs. So sorry this is a little out of room but this phosphorus is still connected to pH with a three there. So what we've actually formed here is a four-membered ring. Carbon to carbon to O and to phosphorus. And what happens here next is oxygen likes to make bonds to phosphorus. I'm going to break the carbon oxygen bond and I'm going to break the phosphorus carbon bond to separate these two molecules. So I'm breaking this bond here 
and that bond there. And what that leads to is our six-membered ring. We now have a double bond to our carbon, and that carbon is connected to, of course, a carbon and a hydrogen. And the other product that we form here is our triphenylphosphine oxide. And that is the mechanism, and there's the alkene that we form. So again, just to review, steps one and two make our phosphonium illid. Triphenylphosphine will do a substitution reaction, an SN2, to kick out the BR. We add a very strong base, which will deprotonate the hydrogen. That forms our phosphonium illid. We can represent that in two different ways. Our phosphonium illid will then attack the carbon of the carbonyl, forming an O-. minus. We get this intermediate here. The O will then attack the phosphorus to get this four-membered ring. And these electrons will rearrange to break the carbon-oxygen bond, break the carbon-phosphorus bond, leaving with us an alkene and triphenylphosphine oxide. So this is the mechanism and the product that we form. All right, let's look at another example here. So in this case, I'm not asking you to synthesize the phosphonium illid. In fact, we're given the phosphonium illid from the beginning. Okay, so if we're asked to draw out the product, what we're going to remember is we're going to form a double bond from the carbon that's connected to the phosphorus to the carbon of our aldehyde. So we can easily just draw the product here. So we'll have our benzene ring. This was connected to a carbon of an aldehyde. A lot of times with aldehydes, what I like to do is draw in the C double bond O here. So students recognize that that is an aldehyde. And instead of having that carbon double bond to an O, that carbon is going to form a double bond to this carbon here. So when we have one carbon, here we have one carbon. And we'll just draw in our two H's so we can clearly see what our product is. So that's what the product would be from this reaction. Just so we see it one more time, let's actually go through the mechanism. Okay, so here we have the phosphonium illid, shown as the double bond. We can have this double bond attack the carbon, kick up those electrons. Here we have our benzene ring that's connected to our O minus with a negative. There's our new bond connected from the carbon of the carbonyl to the carbon that's connected to two H's and the phosphorus. So we'll draw those in and I'll draw them in blue to make it a little easier to see. So we still have our phosphorus here. That phosphorus has a plus and we have three benzene rings. Now I'll just draw out the benzene rings so it's a little easier to see. Yeah, that's not clear. Let's just write pH three for our three benzene rings. Again, what happens in this intermediate, the oxygen will attack the phosphorus. So we're gonna generate that four-membered ring There's our benzene ring connected to our carbon and our O. They still are connected to that carbon with our two H's. 
that carbon still connected to phosphorus. There's the oxygen-phosphorus bond we just formed. The phosphorus no longer has a positive charge, and those three benzene rings are still attached. To finish the mechanism, we just need to form the oxygen-phosphorus double bond by breaking the carbon-oxygen bond, break the carbon-phosphorus bond to form our alkene, and that will give you the final product. Now one thing I just want to mention is that the Wittig reaction is um, very complicated. There's a lot of um, reactions that are very similar to it. This is just a basic introduction to the Wittig. And what I want you to do for homework is to work on this problem here. So what I'd like you to do is to predict what the product would be and draw out the mechanism. So just like we did on the previous slide, draw out the product and then show the mechanism on how that product is formed.